You really mean to your spiritual self. And I have a book, by the way, of names that uh, Billy gave me. There's thousands of names in there with the sounds, how you say the words, and what the meaning actually means to your spirit. So when she's saying Edward means preserver of the treasure, that's what she's referring to. When you say the sounds, Edward, the sound of that phrase uh, to your spirit means preserver of the treasure. And that was the basis for this old Lyrian language that she's talking about. Uh, Simyasi, her name means semi Ishwish. And Ishwish, to reiterate, means king of wisdom or god of all knowledge. And she's halfway through the studies or halfway through the evolution of becoming an Ishwish, so, so she's a semi Ishwish. And semi in their language is E L O, so Elo. And a female Ishwish is called an Ishrish, I S H R I S H. So, in effect, Simyasi is an Elo Ishrish, is how they would pronounce it in her language. So, her, her name really isn't Simyasi. This is a, a name that she's using for these contacts. And, but on her world, she would be referred to as, referred to as Elo Ishrish. Uh, when you uh, hear people channeling all the time and claiming to be uh, uh, channeling Pleiadians and so forth, and you wish to challenge them a little bit to find out if they're really in touch with Pleiadians, you could find out if they know this. If they know anything at all about Pleiadian worlds, then they would understand this concept of language, and they would understand then uh, exactly what these people, what their real names are, and how because they don't call each other like Simyasi and Pata on their planet. They refer to them by their level of uh, knowledge, education, and spiritual evolution. Um, another question was about the size of our galaxy that we're in. Billy was curious because astronomers say that our galaxy, the Milky Way, the spiral galaxy that we live in, they estimate that it's about 30,000 light years to the center of our galaxy. Simyasi commented that uh, not exactly right, that our instruments are not that accurate yet that uh, actually to the center of the galaxy of the Milky Way as measured from uh, our Sol system, from our Sun, would be 53,000 light years. Now we're out kind of on the edge of the suburbs here of our galaxy, but if it's 53,000 light years to the center of our galaxy, that's at least 116,000 light years across, plus we're not clear at the edge. So the Milky Way galaxy could easily be in excess of 125,000 light years across it. If you're not into mathematics, and if that doesn't mean anything to you, uh, imagine it like this. Uh, a light year is expressed, it's the basic theory, theoretical idea of the distance that light will travel in one year. Say, for instance, you went out on a starry night with your flashlight, and you hit the button and flicked your flashlight on. A light immediately leaves your flashlight, doesn't it? It would circle around the planet, if it could you know, go in that direction, for instance, seven times in one second. Because light travels at 186,000 miles in one second. Now, we're used to thinking of things in terms of miles per hour. Okay, if you get in your car and go down the freeway, it's 55 miles in one hour you may be driving. Well, here, light's going 186,000 miles, seven times around the Earth, in one second. Now, here's what a light year is. If light travels at 186,000 miles in one second, it takes 60 seconds to make a minute, doesn't it? So multiply 60 times 186,000, and that's how far light will go in one minute. Well, now it takes, uh, what, 60 minutes to make an hour, so it takes 60 times that number, and that's how far light will travel in one hour, okay? That's only one hour. Now there's 24 hours in a day. So multiply that number times 24, and you've got how far light will travel in a day. Well, that's just one day. Now multiply that number times 365, because we have 365 days in a year. Now you've got a huge number, and that's how far light will travel in one year. Consequently, that is a light year. Now they're telling us that it's 53,000 times that, uh, 53,000 of these light years to get to the center of our galaxy. So we have a, just a fantastically huge number here. So living on our little planet with our primitive devices, our cars and our airplanes, uh, distance relative to the size of the galaxy is way off. <laughs> we have no concept. And that's just inside our galaxy that may perhaps be around 125, 130,000 light years across it in diameter. But then once we leave our galaxy out into free space, 
there are billions and billions of galaxies. We have no concept of the idea or the size of the actual universe itself. So I don't think that you could even express it in light years. Probably if you shot a beam of um, light from our galaxy in a particular direction, if it would continue on forever, it could be countless billions and billions of light years before it would ever even reach you know, any sort of edge to our universe. And again, an edge doesn't exist because it seems to be in a spiral type shape. Okay, Billy is uh, led out to a spot uh, telepathically by Semyasi where he sees a hole burned in the ground where it looks like a saucer has landed. It's about four meters in diameter. And they're also around the center hole. It looks like there's about uh, uh, four other landing tracks where it looks like the landing gear of a ship may have set down. But it doesn't look like a uh, landing tracks from the Palladium beam ships. Also, he starts looking around. It's in the snow uh, around the ship. And he finds footprints leading away from the ship, one of them leading down to a stream and coming back. He finds some footprints that disappear off into the forest and come back. One set of footprints have no trail at all. Just a few meters, about 100 meters away from the uh, ship, there's just one set of footprints in the snow with no trail leading. So how does someone make footprints in the snow with no trail? Looks like they just popped right out of the air and stood down in the snow and then disappeared. Semyasi explains that there was a very small dwarf race who became lost in time and came into the Earth atmosphere. They had sat down there, finding themselves in a rather strange place. They decided to collect some samples and try to figure out where they were. And the footprints that Billy has seen is these little dwarf beings going out to collect samples in the trees and in the water and so forth to ascertain more about the planet. The unusual set of footprints where there was just one footprint in the snow far away from the ship she said that while uh, two or three of the dwarves were out collecting samples, that one of them was kind of posted as a sentry, and he was floating or flying around in the air, and at one particular spot he came too close to the ground and actually sat down in the ground in the snow for a minute and then flew back up into the air. Apparently what had happened uh, is that uh, these were a race of people who were just developing time travel, and it made a mistake, an error in their calculations, and it greatly slipped out of time when they were in hyperspace and found themselves on Earth way out of their own time frame. Semyasi remarked that Ptah would help them, that he would make some efforts to find out uh, where their galaxy was, and then he could return them in his own ship, he could return them back to their own time. That would be possible. Normally, if you're in a ship on your own, and you go into hyperspace, and the, you vary the speed of your particles like we talked about earlier. If you lower that speed too much and there's too much variance, remember you'll slip in time billions of years and you're going to have almost an impossible time ever finding your way back. So uh, here's the situation where that actually happened. On the 70th contact, which was on Thursday, January 6, 77, here we're almost up to an anniversary contact, because Billy's contact started on January 28, 75, so we're almost two years now into the contacts, and we've had 70 of them. Billy had some questions about uh, atoms and molecules. He'd remembered that Semyasi at one point had told him there was some molecule that had 49 atoms in it, and he wanted a lengthier explanation about what that was. She said, well, that's the most unusual molecule because uh, when spiritual energy is formed, that the first molecule, the first primary steps and beginning of formation of spiritual energy is a molecule formed of 49 atoms in it. Now the atom itself, she said, is not pure material. Our scientists are still thinking of it as uh, uh, all coarse matter, that an atom is completely uh, solid matter, but it is not. She said that an atom is actually a crossover, and the crossover was the phrase they used, that an atom is a crossover between uh, material matter and spiritual energy. That both things go into comprising an atom, but our scientists have not discovered that yet. <laughs> Atoms can be explained, she said, by in sevens. The Pleiadians call it the sevens of the synthesis of matter. That atoms actually have seven planes to them. Uh, currently, our science seems to be aware of two levels, in other words, two breakdowns of what an atom, what is inside of an atom. 
there are seven levels. The seventh and the sixth level, she says, are now aware to our science, that we've figured out the seventh level of what's inside of an atom. And we've even got, become some aware of the sixth plane, which is composed of elementary particles. But she says, at least as of 1977 uh, here, that our scientists currently are confused by the fifth plane. It's a mystery. Now, up to, we're up in 92 now, so I don't know how we may have advanced in those areas. But she says they also have to discover that there are four more planes down, four more different levels uh, breaking an atom down as you go smaller and smaller into matter. There's also, aside from that, a microatomic plane besides the normal atom planes. So apparently there be seen to be subdivisions of the atom which follow the uh, uh, same premise that the universe does, breaking sevens down into sevens. She says, but mainly what has to be discerned as we move along is that, uh, that uh, atoms and matter are not the only thing. This is where we actually discover technically what spiritual energy is when we start breaking down the atoms. Well, Billy wants to play a joke on his friends, and after this contact comes to an end, he says uh, he notices, sees on the screens that his friends are waiting for him down in the uh, coal down below. They've had to drive about 20 miles from home, actually 20 kilometers, it says. These Europeans and their metrics. He's about 20 kilometers away uh, from his home, and he wants to play a little joke on his friends. So he asked him, Yossi, if she could set him down. Uh, in a, uh, a field close to home, back close to home, so he wouldn't have to go so far. And uh, he would call on the radio and let his friends know where he's at so they could come and pick him up. Well, he does that, and Simeasi uh, takes him back close to his home, sets him down in a snowy field, in the middle of a field with snow, and he calls his friends on the radio. Well, they come to get him, and not only are they kind of surprised somehow that he could get back the 20 kilometers back to home, but how did he wind up out in the middle of this field with no tracks out to where he's standing? So he, he quite often did this and had a little fun with them. On Billy's birthday, which was February 3rd, 1977, was his 72nd contact. By the way, that's his birthday where he turns 40 years old on that birthday. It was at this particular occasion that Simyasi again reiterated to Billy that it's time to move out of Henville. Hinville is H-I-N-W-E-L, and this is where Billy's lived for a long period of time, and he's been living there so far all through the contacts. But uh, she's telling him that it's time for him to move, time for him to find a new place, and she says uh, she shows him a map to help him decide where it is that he should move. On this, it's not actually a map. Uh, Billy has a map with him of Switzerland, and inside of the ship on one of the side screens, she is showing him the different locations in Europe and the problems that are going to arise in the next few years, which should dictate where he moves. And she's showing him on the screen, says, here's an area where there's going to be a lot of very strong earthquake activity. You don't want to move there. Here's an area where there's actually going to be a volcano uprise in Switzerland that's uh, currently, apparently, we're not aware of at the moment, but there's going to be some sort of volcano in Switzerland which is going to erupt, causing a major loss of life. She says along this uh, flat zone in the northern part of Switzerland, you want to avoid this because it's going to be destroyed by fire during the coming war. Apparently, our next war, there's some uh, new devices going to be used that set the atmosphere on fire. A lot of firestorms in the air burning the ground. It's interesting that... Uh, an unrelated set of uh, information which comes from the Nostradamus papers, which many people have uh, made their own versions of, that many of them agree that Nostradamus talks about the Chinese inventing new weapons that ignite the atmosphere and cause these firestorms also. So there might be some correlation here between Nostradamus, here between Nostradamus's prediction of the third world breaking out caused by the Chinese marching on Europe with firestorm devices, and the Pleiadian prophecy saying that, yes, that there will be uh, firestorms over Europe. And again, remember that she talks about, even in the 70s, that our American government is fooling around with devices which cause chain reaction in the air and ignite the atmosphere and burn the planet. That was one of the main things that they were very concerned about always. Uh, she shows him four areas that are very suitable. And uh, one of the best, she says, is this area between where the volcano is going to happen and these earth, particular earthquake zones. So she's pointing out to uh, him, you know, where to look to move. 
Well, Billy says that's great. He's very interested in building a center where he and the others could live and have their own way of life. But where's the money going to come from for this? Um, she, 